Well, welcome to the Sunday School lesson. Now, if you're following the lesson in the quarterly, you will know that this is going to be different. When I read the two lessons in the quarterly for senior adults from the Song of Solomon, I made up my mind I was going to teach something else, simply because it's sex education for senior adults. Now, folks, if you don't know about that by now, there's not much I can do to help you. If you don't know how babies get here, call me and we'll talk about it. But I'm not going to teach a course on sex education to senior adults. Maybe I should. Maybe I'm naive. But I'm not going to do it. I'm going to teach a lesson today on why go to church. And then next week, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you lost your song? Those two things are really viable for senior adults in this day and time in which we're living. Confusing at best, frustrating for sure. But folks, you have to do the things that will keep you safe. I understand that. But the thing I hear most when I make my calls on the telephone, talk to folks in the Sunday school classes, the thing I almost invariably get, I miss going to church. Now let me tell you how this sermon came to pass. I drove for over four hours one Saturday afternoon to get to a preaching assignment for Sunday morning checked into the hotel, and tried to get ready for Sunday morning. Well, as my form has always been, I try to get there a little early. Well, I got to the church early, not real early, sat down on the front pew for the folks to come in. Only one person who came into the church greeted me in any way. And his, his was more of a grunt than a greet. I preached, they left, not one word was said. So I knew I had to drive four hours back to Jacksonville that afternoon. I have to tell you, there was a little holy tick in my life. I'd driven eight hours. So on the way back to Jacksonville, it kept popping in my mind. I wonder why those folks came to church to begin with. Why were they there? What happened because they were there? Then I took a little piece of paper, laid it on my console, and I'd just scribble a note or two. Why do people go to church? Well, I listed some things, and here's what I listed. Number one. They go because their friends go. They want to be with their friends. Now, this is especially true among senior adults. They want to go where their friends go. They've grown up with these folks. They know these folks. They are in Sunday school class. They want to go where their friends go. Number two, they go because the family goes. We all go together as a family. That's good. That's wonderful. They go together as a family. Number three, we go together for we go to church for fellowship. Some folks go to church because they feel like it's a duty to go to church, so they go to church as a duty. Some folks go to church because there's an expectation on the part of someone else that they would go to church. Now that was me and not our, our children. It was not unusual for me to call on Sunday night after church and say to one or all of my three kids, how was church today? Now, if there was a long pause, I realized they didn't like that question. They hadn't gone to church that day. And Dad would chastise them a little bit, and they would agree that they should have, but they didn't. And give some lame excuse that they had. Now. Some folks go to church because there's a high level of expectancy. There is on my part, even today, 
with my children. A high level of expectancy on Sunday morning that they would be in church. High level. Because every mouthful of food that my children have ever eaten while they were home, that food was provided by the church as they paid my salary. So I have a high level of expectation. Some folks go to church actually to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now with those things in the background, and by the way, if you go through that list again, this could also be the reason why some folks don't go to church. They don't have any friends that go to church. Their family doesn't go to church. There's no expectation by anyone else that they go to church. They feel no compunction of duty to go to church. So the reasons they go could also be the reasons they do not go. There has to be one solid reason why people go to church. Now, I will say this more than one time in this lesson. You get up and get ready to go to the house of God to hear the man of God preach the word of God so you can find the will of God. Let me say it again. You get up and get ready to go to church to hear the man of God preach the word of God so that you can come to understand the will of God for your life. Now, as we do that, listen to what the 73rd Psalm has to say. Psalm 73. Here it is. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. I had just about walked away. My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Here's the reason why. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there is no pain in their death. There is no, but their strength is, in, is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued as other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could desire. At eyes standing out with, they have plenty. They want for nothing. Now that's the diagnosis that he gives us. In the understanding. The diagnosis is very simple. It simply wants us to know and to understand. Diagnosis means that I, I find myself looking at both sides of the issue and trying to bring to agreement somewhere in a compromised situation. Now, before I get to that, let me just say two or three things about the church that I feel very strongly about. The church is a miracle of God. That the church has survived for all of these years is a miracle of God. More than one time, folks have tried to wipe it out. But the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The church is going to stay alive. So I'm very fond of the church. I love going to church. In fact, my family has always accused me of going to church more probably than I needed to. I don't know about that. But I love going to church. I want to be involved in what the church is doing. And I can tell you the direct influence of First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida will be in direct proportion to your willingness to serve him in light and truth. The direct influence of this church is dependent on the members of the church and service in light and truth. Also, I want you to understand that I feel we are abandoning the church because, not because of theology. Oh, Baptists have had great theology of the church. The church is where God comes 
to visit. Now, that is not to say, and people have misunderstood that at times, you can find the will of God anywhere, anytime when you stop long enough to do it. But the place I have found the will of God for my life and for my ministry, more often than not, has been in a worship service in a church. So we are abandoning it, not by theological reason, but because we are not attending. We are not involved. We are not influencing folks. So the diagnosis becomes very important at that reason. We're doing it from the inside as well as the outside. Now look at his diagnosis. One, they have no struggle, those who have plenty. You look at them, looks like they have no struggle. They have no burdens. In fact, they parade their ungodliness. It's like a garment. It's like a chain. They have violence for their clothing. They scoff. They are arrogant. They're carefree. They're gaining wealth. And our mind tends, when we focus on those things, to become envious of the prosperity, to become envious of well, those who seem to have no struggle. And I use the word seem because they do have struggles. They just seem that they have no struggles, that they can buy their way through, they can buy their way out, whatever they need to do. And so our mind locks in to our calculation, and then we miss the best of God. Let me say it again. We diagnose something. Our mind locks in to that diagnosis, and we lose the best of God. Prosperity is not the underlining thing about knowing God and why to go to church. I know there is what's called the prosperity gospel. I know that God prospers people, but it's not always financially. It's not always financially. Nancy and I have come through just the roughest days of our 65 years of marriage. And I guarantee you, God gets the glory. And we had good doctors and good nurses, wonderful people. For 23 days, they waited on her needs. Wonderful people. Couldn't have asked for better, couldn't have asked for more. But I know, I know beyond the shadow of doubt, no question in my mind that the great physician was in the room when she went through her toughest time. No doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind that she knew that as well. So, don't let your mind lock into what you see. Let your mind lock into God for clarification of what you see. We see what we want to see so we can do what we want to do and justify what we've done. Don't lock in to what you see. Now, the second thing, not only was there the diagnosis, then comes the dilemma. What do I do about the dilemma of going to church? Look at verse 13 of Psalm 73, beginning with verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Now he's, he's in the dilemma. I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued, chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Now that's his dilemma. The dilemma is this. Do I go to church to hear the man of God preach the word of God so that I can know the will of God for my life? Do I go to church for that reason? That's part of the dilemma. And if I cannot get any understanding in that dilemma, the horns of the dilemma is this. Do I do this 
or do I not do this on the basis of what I see? Now, here's his dilemma as he discusses it with us. Number one, I'm going nowhere by knocking myself out for God. It's getting me nowhere. I'm no better off today than I was last year. It's getting me nowhere. That's part of his diagnosis. I've had a pure heart. I've had clean hands. I just don't understand all of this. I've, I've worked my fingers to the bones and all I get is bony fingers. I don't see any prosperity. I don't see any this, that, thus, and so. I don't see any of that. I still have confusion. I am in a dilemma. I am on the horns of the dilemma. Give me understanding. Help me to know. Help me to understand. I can't understand. I'm confused. I'm oppressed. I'm oppressed by all of this. Help me. And then there's not only the diagnosis, there's not only the dilemma, now comes the decision. Now, oh, what, what this decision does in this lesson in the Psalms is absolutely beyond joy. Here's what he says. Now keep in mind, I keep repeating, keep in mind, he's looked around, he's locked in his mind the prosperity of the wicked. He's looked around and he's looked at himself and he's locked in his mind. I'm knocking myself out for God by keeping clean hands and a pure heart and I'm getting nowhere. I don't feel any better today about God than I did yesterday. What am I going to do about it? My dilemma is I have to do something about it. Now, look at what he does in Psalm 73 about his decision to do what God wants him to do. It's in verse 17. Verse, beginning with verse 17. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood. Now, why do you go to church? Because of the dilemma. And then you come to realize, I make a decision and in that decision, I go into the sanctuary of God, and then I understand. What does he understand? Listen to what he understands. Surely thou didst set them in the slippery places. Thou cast them down to destruction. They are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed. Now, he goes into the sanctuary, and this is his discovery out of his decision. He discovers, number one, I've been looking at the wrong thing. Those folks are going, they're the ones on the slippery slope. I'm not on a slippery slope. I'm on a solid rock. And as long as I stay on the solid rock, I don't have to get on the slippery slope. And I get up and go to the house of God to hear the man of God, preach the word of God, so I can find the will of God for my life. He goes into the sanctuary, and then it begins to clear up. Now, drop on down to verse 23. And this is what I want to end with in verse 23 and following. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. Afterward, you receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. Now that's his discovery. Look at what he discovers. It is unbelievable, his decision to go to church. And now he makes the decision and he understands, I am on the solid rock. They will be destroyed. I live in your presence. Now how is he going to do? How are we going to do in his presence? He's going to guide us. He's going to be with us. He's going to help us in every dilemma in this. He holds us by, his, by our right hand. He holds us by the right hand. The right hand is always the symbol of authority and, and commitment. Raise your right hand. Swear after me. 
raise your right hand, swear after me. It's the hand of authority. He has the authority over our life. And in that authority, he is going to guide us into what is good and what is right. But that's not the end of the story of why you go to church. You can go to church because of friends, because of fellowship, because you go to church to find the will, help you find the will of God for your life and how he wants you to live. And then as a result of all of that, here, here's the payback. Here's what happens when we understand that. In the, 20, in the 73rd Psalm, here's what we find. Whom have I in heaven but you? And you, there is none upon the earth that I desire more than you. Number one, let me put it this way. He has a grip on us. Number two, he has a guide for us. And number three, he has glory for us on the other side. You see, folks, as the people of God, we always ought to live with what's on the other side as well as what's on this side. We ought to think about heaven and our home that he's prepared for us. John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go again and prepare a place for you, I, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you shall also be. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know? How can we know the way? Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. And so in this thing of the glory of God for our life, I'll not preach my whole sermon on heaven, but the most beautiful place that's ever described in any book is when the Bible describes for us heaven on the other side of this life. For you see, the truth is, the people of God do not die. They are only transformed. We live, we go to a higher form of life. We become the, angel, the people of God who live in heaven. We become more like angels than men. And as a result of that, we see ourselves in the heavenly place. The place that he has prepared. The glorious, wonderful place where there is no sorrow. There is no pain. There is no Cobus. There is no Cobus 19. There is no being isolated. There is no fear. When you're with Jesus, when we get to glory, those things will pass away. Only the peace and glory of God that comes to our life. So we look for the glory of God. It's a place of absolutely unqualified beauty. He says all he knows to say about it and then comes back to say, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, it has not yet entered into the heart of man all that God is preparing for his people. And that's part of who I am. I think about the glory of God. Now, let me walk back and just summarize before we're through. First of all, we need to understand why we go to church. If we're just going for fellowship, that's okay, but that's, that's inadequate. If we are just going for friendship, that's okay, but that's inadequate. If we're going just because the family wants to go or makes us go, that's inadequate. That's inadequate. We go to worship God in spirit and in truth. Let me say it one last time. We get up, we get ready to go to the house of God. If you have been listening to my John studies, one of the fulfillments of Jesus as the Messiah was the fulfillment of the temple. In the Holy of Holies in the temple, more than any other place, is where God came to meet man and man came to meet God. Now, I ought to anticipate that Jesus is going to be present in the worship service of my church 
and that I can meet God in the worship experience of my church. I hear the man of God. I do not want to listen to a preacher that does not know he is called of God and live like he is called of God. If I can't trust him, I don't want to pay him. So the man of God preached the word. Our pastor preaches the word of God. Hear the man of God preach the word of God so that I can know the will of God. Now the psalmist says, and all of these questions, all of this dilemma, after my diagnosis, and I was totally confused until I went into the sanctuary and then I understood. Why do you go to church? Think about it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that we know in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel that preaches him to us. Help us to keep our minds on eternity. Heavenly Father, I know we have to live day by day, but there's always out there more promised. That's eternal life in heaven with you and the saints of God. Bless the Sunday School lesson. In Jesus' name, amen.